Lesson 3 The Everlasting Covenant Sabbath Afternoon October 9 Living in the midst of idolatry and corruption, the Israelites had no true conception of the holiness of God, of the exceeding sinfulness of their own hearts, their utter inability in themselves to render obedience to God's law, and their need of a Savior. All this they must be taught. God brought them to Sinai. He manifested His glory. He gave them His law with the promise of great blessings on condition of obedience. If ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. Exodus chapter 19 verses 5 and 6. They had witnessed the proclamation of the law in awful majesty and had trembled with terror before the mount, and yet only a few weeks passed before they broke their covenant with God and bowed down to worship a graven image. They could not hope for the favor of God through a covenant which they had broken, and now, seeing their sinfulness and their need of pardon, they were brought to feel their need of the Savior revealed in the Abrahamic covenant and shadowed forth in the sacrificial offerings. Now by faith and love, they were bound to God as their deliverer from the bondage of sin. Now they were prepared to appreciate the blessings of the new covenant. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 371 and 372. To the omnipotence of the King of Kings, our covenant-keeping God unites the gentleness and care of a tender shepherd. Nothing can stand in His way. His power is absolute, and it is the pledge of the sure fulfillment of His promises to His people. He can remove all obstructions to the advancement of His work. He has means for the removal of every difficulty that those who serve Him and respect the means He employs may be delivered. His goodness and love are infinite and His covenant is unalterable. The plans of the enemies of His work may seem to be firm and well established, but He can overthrow the strongest of these plans, and in His own time and way, he will do this when he sees that our faith has been sufficiently tested and that we are drawing near to him and making him our counselor. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8, Page 10 God will not break his covenant nor alter the things that has gone out of his lips. His word will stand fast forever as unalterable as his throne. At the judgment, this covenant will be brought forth plainly written with the finger of God, and the world will be arraigned before the bar of infinite justice to receive sentence. Today, as in the days of Elijah, the line of demarcation between God's commandment-keeping people and the worshippers of false gods is clearly drawn. And the message for today is, Babylon the great is fallen is fallen. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Revelation chapter 18, verses 2, 4, and 5. Prophets and Kings, page 187. Sunday, October 10. The Covenant and the Gospel. Abraham, to whom the covenant promise was first given, had been called to go forth from his kindred to the regions beyond, that he might be a light bearer to the heathen. Although the promise to him included a posterity as numerous as the sand by the sea, yet it was for no selfish purpose that he was to become the founder of a great nation in the land of Canaan. God's covenant with him embraced all the nations of earth. I will bless thee, Jehovah declared, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. In the renewal of the covenant shortly before the birth of Isaac, God's purpose for mankind was again made plain. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him, was the assurance of the Lord concerning the child of promise. 
Genesis chapter 18, verse 18. And later, the heavenly visitant once more declared, In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. Prophets and Kings, pages 367 and 368. The promises made to Abraham and confirmed to his son were held by Isaac and Rebekah as the great object of their desires and hopes. With these promises, Esau and Jacob were familiar. They were taught to regard the birthright as a matter of great importance, for it included not only an inheritance of worldly wealth, but spiritual preeminence. He who received it was to be the priest of his family, and in the line of his posterity, the Redeemer of the world would come. On the other hand, there were obligations resting upon the possessor of the birthright. He who should inherit its blessings must devote his life to the service of God. Like Abraham, he must be obedient to the divine requirements. In marriage, in his family relations, in public life, he must consult the will of God. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 177. Under the New Covenant, the conditions by which eternal life may be gained are the same as under the Old, perfect obedience. Under the Old Covenant, there were many offenses of a daring presumptuous character for which there was no atonement specified by law. In the New and Better Covenant, Christ has fulfilled the law for the transgressors of law if they receive him by faith as a personal Savior. Mercy and forgiveness are the reward of all who come to Christ trusting in his merits to take away their sins. In the better covenant, we are cleansed from sin by the blood of Christ. The sinner is helpless to atone for one sin. The power is in Christ's free gift a promise appreciated by those only who are sensible of their sins and who forsake their sins and cast their helpless souls upon Christ, the sin-pardoning Savior. He will put into their hearts His perfect law, which is holy and just and good. Romans chapter 7, verse 12. That I may know Him, page 299. Monday, October 11, The Covenant and Israel The Lord brought His people out of Egypt in a victorious manner. He led them through the wilderness to prove them and try them. He repeatedly manifested His miraculous power in their deliverances from their enemies. He promised to take them to Himself as His peculiar treasure if they would obey His voice and keep his commandments. He did not forbid them to eat the flesh of animals, but withheld it from them in a great measure. He provided them food which was the most healthful. He rained their bread from heaven and gave them purest water from the flinty rock. He made a covenant with them. If they would obey him in all things, he would preserve them from disease. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 412. A nominal faith in Christ, which accepts Him merely as the Savior of the world, can never bring healing to the soul. The faith that is unto salvation is not a mere intellectual assent to the truth. He who waits for entire knowledge before he will exercise faith cannot receive blessing from God. It is not enough to believe about Christ. We must believe in Him. The only faith that will benefit us is that which embraces Him as a personal Savior, which appropriates His merits to ourselves. Many hold faith as an opinion. Saving faith is a transaction by which those who receive Christ join themselves in covenant relation with God. Genuine faith is life. A living faith means an increase of vigor, a confiding trust by which the soul becomes a conquering power. The Desire of Ages, page 347. Of special value to God's Church on earth today are the messages of counsel and admonition given through the prophets who have made plain His eternal purpose in behalf of mankind. In the teachings of the prophets, His love for the lost race and His plan for their salvation 
are clearly revealed. The story of Israel's call, of their successes and failures, of their restoration to divine favor, of their rejection of the master of the vineyard, and of the carrying out of the plan of the ages by a goodly remnant to whom are to be fulfilled all the covenant promises, this has been the theme of God's messengers to his church throughout the centuries that have passed. And today, God's message to his church, to those who are occupying his vineyard as faithful husbandmen, is none other than that spoken through the prophets of old. Let Israel hope in God. The master of the vineyard is even now gathering from among men of all nations and peoples the precious fruits for which he has long been waiting. Soon he will come unto his own, and in that glad day his eternal purpose for the house of Israel will finally be fulfilled. He shall cause them that come of Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. Prophets and Kings, page 22. Tuesday, October 12. The Book of the Covenant Upon descending from the mountain, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord hath said will we do. This pledge, together with the words of the Lord which it bound them to obey, was written by Moses in a book. Then followed the ratification of the covenant. Having sprinkled the altar with the blood of the offerings, Moses took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. Thus the conditions of the covenant were solemnly repeated, and all were at liberty to choose whether or not they would comply with them. They had at the first promised to obey the voice of God, but they had since heard his law proclaimed, and its principles had been particularized that they might know how much this covenant involved. Again the people answered with one accord, All that the Lord hath said will we do, and be obedient. When Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 19 and 20. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 311 and 312. By proclaiming the Ten Commandments to the children of Israel with his own voice, God demonstrated their importance. In awful grandeur, he made known his majesty and authority as ruler of the world. This he did to impress the people with the sacredness of his law and the importance of obeying it. The power and glory with which the law was given reveal its importance. It is the faith once delivered to the saints by Christ our Redeemer, speaking from Sinai. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8, page 198 From a race of slaves, the Israelites had been exalted above all peoples to be the peculiar treasure of the King of Kings. God had separated them from the world that he might commit to them a sacred trust. He had made them the depositaries of his law, and he purposed through them to preserve among men the knowledge of himself. Thus the light of heaven was to shine out to a world enshrouded in darkness, and a voice was to be heard appealing to all peoples to turn from their idolatry to serve the living God. If the Israelites would be true to their trust, they would become a power in the world. God would be their defense, and he would exalt them above all other nations. His light and truth would be revealed through them, and they would stand forth under his wise and holy rule as an example of the superiority of his worship over every form of idolatry. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 314. Wednesday, October 13. His Special People. The most licentious and abominable rites were part of the heathen worship. The gods themselves were represented as impure and their worshippers gave the rein to the baser passions. Unnatural vices prevailed and the religious festivals were characterized by universal and open impurity. From the opening of the great controversy, 
It has been Satan's purpose to misrepresent God's character and to excite rebellion against his law, and this work appears to be crowned with success. The multitudes give ear to Satan's deceptions and set themselves against God. But amid the working of evil, God's purposes move steadily forward to their accomplishment. To all created intelligences, he is making manifest his justice and benevolence. Through Satan's temptations, the whole human race have become transgressors of God's law. But by the sacrifice of his Son, a way is opened whereby they may return to God. Through the grace of Christ, they may be enabled to render obedience to the Father's law. Thus in every age, from the midst of apostasy and rebellion, God gathers out a people that are true to him, a people in whose heart is his law. Isaiah chapter 51, verse 7. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 337 and 338. The purpose of all God's commandments is to reveal man's duty not only to God, but to his fellow man. In this late age of the world's history, we are not, because of the selfishness of our hearts, to question or dispute the right of God to make these requirements or we will deceive ourselves and rob our souls of the richest blessings of the grace of God. Heart and mind and soul are to be merged in the will of God. Then the covenant, framed from the dictates of infinite wisdom and made binding by the power and authority of the King of kings and Lord of lords, will be our pleasure. It is enough that he has said that obedience to his statutes and laws is the life and prosperity of his people. The blessings of God's covenant are mutual. God accepts those who will work for his name's glory to make his name a praise in a world of apostasy and idolatry. He will be exalted by his commandment-keeping people that he may make them high above all nations which he hath made in praise and in name and in honor. Deuteronomy chapter 26 verse 19 God's Amazing Grace, page 150 Every day we are making our history. Yesterday is beyond our amendment or control. Today only is ours. Then let us not grieve the Spirit of God today, for tomorrow we shall not be able to recall what we have done. Today will then be yesterday. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 149. Thursday October 14. Other Images The wilderness wandering was not only ordained as a judgment upon the rebels and murmurers, but was to serve as a discipline for the rising generation preparatory to their entrance into the promised land. Moses declared to them, As a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee, to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 5, 2, and 3. He found him in a desert land, and in the waste howling wilderness, he led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 10 and Isaiah chapter 63 verse 9. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 407. One well-ordered, well-disciplined family tells more in behalf of Christianity than all the sermons that can be preached. A lamp, however small, if kept steadily burning, may be the means of lighting many other lamps. Our sphere of influence may seem narrow, our ability small, our opportunities few, our acquirements limited. Yet wonderful possibilities are ours through a faithful use of the opportunities of our own homes. If we will open our hearts and home to the divine principles of life, we shall become channels for currents of life-giving power. 
From our homes will flow streams of healing, bringing life and beauty and fruitfulness. My Life Today, page 124. Those who have genuine love for God will manifest an earnest desire to know His will and to do it, says the Apostle John, whose epistles treat so fully upon love. This is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. The child who loves his parents will show that love by willing obedience, but the selfish, ungrateful child seeks to do as little as possible for his parents, while he at the same time desires to enjoy all the privileges granted to the obedient and faithful. The same difference is seen among those who profess to be children of God. Many who know that they are the objects of His love and care and who desire to receive His blessing take no delight in doing His will. They regard God's claims upon them as an unpleasant restraint, His commandments as a grievous yoke. But he who is truly seeking for holiness of heart and life delights in the law of God and mourns only that he falls so far short of meeting its requirements. It is not only the privilege but the duty of every Christian to maintain a close union with Christ and to have a rich experience in the things of God. Then his life will be fruitful in good works. Said Christ, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. John chapter 15, verse 8. The Sanctified Life, pages 81 and 83. For further reading, In Heavenly Places, A Work of Preparation, page 347, and Prophets and Kings, The Book of the Law, pages 392 to 396.